Able's in on air is sponsored by Green Mountain Support Services, empowering people with disabilities to be home in the community. Washington County Mental Health, where hope and support comes together. Media sponsors for Ableton On Air include Parkchester Times, Muslim Community Report, www.thisisthebronx.info, Associated Press Media Editors, New York Parrot Online Newspaper, U.S. Press Corps, Domestic and International, Anchor FM, and Spotify. Partners for Ableton On Air include Yachad, New York and New England, where everyone belongs. The Orthodox Union. The Vermont Division for the Blind and Visually Impaired. The Vermont Association for the Blind and Visually Impaired. The Montpelier Sustainable Coalition. Central Vermont, Habitat for Humanity. Abel Air has been seen in the following publications. Parkchester Times. New York Parrot Online Newspaper. Muslim Community Report, www.thisisthebronx.info, and www.h.com. Ableton On Air is a member of the National Academy for Television Arts and Sciences, Boston, New England chapter. Welcome to this edition of Able to Non Air, the one and only program that focuses on the needs, concerns, and achievements of the differently able. I've always been your host, Lawrence Seiler. On this, on this edition, uh, before we uh, get to our important edition of um, the second part to uh, the Kennedys and their work, uh, we would like to say um, uh, thank you to our sponsors, Washington, Washington County Mental Health, Green Mountain Support Services, and many others, including the partnership for the, from uh, the Association for the Blind of Vermont, the Division for the Blind of Vermont, and many, many others. We would like to welcome Dr. Herbert Cohen of the uh, Kennedy Center. Um, Dr. Cohen, for many years, has been a, uh, a foremost leader in pediatrics and uh, and children with special needs. Welcome, Dr. Cohen, to Able Then On Air. Okay. Uh, Dr. Cohen, uh, could you um, uh, tell us um, a little bit of um, your, uh, well, a lot of your work, and um, let's start there. What has been your work in the field of pediatrics and working with special needs for many years? Well, I came to Albert Einstein Medical School under the mentorship of Dr. Larry Taft, who established our program in 1956. And uh, I came there as actually a fellow of his from 1962 to 1964. And I stayed, eventually became the assistant director, and then became the director of the center, mm -hmm. uh, which I did until uh, about uh, 12 years ago, uh, when I became an emeritus director, um, and have continued to teach and until uh, a year and a half ago, see patients of my own and follow them over the years. Uh, so I have been a became a specialist in developmental pediatrics, mm -hmm. which includes taking care of uh, children, uh, adolescents, and uh, some adults uh, with developmental disabilities. Okay. So I became a specialist in the field beginning in 1962, really, and then continuing on uh, for the rest of my career until the current time. I'm now an emeritus professor, and I am semi-retired. I still give some lectures, mm -hmm. uh, but I have not done any hands-on work with any patients for the past year and a half. Okay. Uh, how, how important... Um, is having a doctor or a specialist dealing with um, special needs, you know, because, you know, special needs is a field that um, is extremely important. So how really important is it to, to get uh, services, especially if you're a child or young adult with special needs? Well, I have to say that when I first came, uh, we had a small group of professionals 
But as I've learned over the years that the, the pediatrician or developmental pediatrician plays a significant role in dealing with the medical needs of children, also in diagnosing uh, what the uh, problem may be. And, um, but uh, uh, very importantly in our field, we work as part of a team. And um, though we may have a, a leadership role, depending on how much training and experience we have, we work with psychologists and social workers and occupational and physical therapists and speech pathologists and uh, other people in the field, nutrition, nursing. We've had a very large team that we have worked with over the years, and I consider myself a member of that team, but uh, hopefully an important member of that team in order to provide very comprehensive range of services, including diagnostic and treatment services. Okay, uh, let, let's talk um, about the work of the Kennedys and, uh, uh, you know, obviously we know about Rosemary Kennedy, but um, it, what was the historical bias at the time of the Kennedys, especially when trying to find um, services um, like talking about 1959, 1960s, um, especially when trying to find services for uh, children with developmental uh, delays or disabilities? Well, the Kennedys play a very important role. Uh, when I first came into the field in the early 1960s, uh, there was a limited number of professionals uh, involved with the field, and also there were a very limited number of options for children and for adults with uh, special needs. And uh, it was also a, a situation in which families were often embarrassed and, and people literally be kept in closets and not provided any range of services at all, except maybe for some limited special educational services. But the Kennedy's fundamental role was to be very open about the fact that they had, a president had a sister, Rosemary, who had developmental problems. We're not exactly sure what her problem was. She probably had some delays and maybe even been on the autistic spectrum, but we weren't even clear about that. But anyway, but at least the Kennedys announced that they had this family member and Rose would come on TV, the mother, and say, well, we had a child, but nobody understood or told us what to do. And here they were, this first family of the country coming out and saying that they had a family member who had significant developmental problems. Now, in addition to that, uh, the Kennedy, and really the driving force of the family was really Eunice Shriver. Eunice was the sister who was closest to Rosemary. And uh, Eunice told me over the years that uh, she felt responsible for her sister because she was like her sister's minder, basically, being the sister who was close to her in age. In age. Mm -hmm. And uh, so Eunice, I think, pushed the family to, to publicize what the problem was. At any rate, uh, the president organized a panel on, uh, on mental retardation, as it was called in those days. And uh, that panel consisted of some consumers, but a lot of uh, professionals in education and actually mostly psychiatry. Maybe there was one pediatrician on the group. Um, and what they did was uh, at his uh, uh, charge to them, they came with a series of recommendations recommendations in order to change or improve the field and, and the care of people with disabilities. So that led to the passage of Public Law 88164, which was the Mental Health and Mental Rehabilitation and Facilities Development Act. Mm -hmm. And it had several components. Uh, one of those components was to expand the community mental health services because there were psychiatrists who were interested in, in seeing expansion of that. And supposedly those centers are supposed to take care of people with dis disabilities, but that part of it really never was very effective. But the other two uh, components and the recommendations, because we had a lot of academics who were on that panel, and they uh, recommended that there are two things that should be done. One was to involve universities and in more research into the field. And that led to the founding of what were then originally 10, uh, quote, mental retardation research centers. Mm -hmm. Now they're called developmental disability research centers throughout the country. And one of them actually was the Kennedy Center, where uh, the federal formula said that you needed to have a uh, matching money of 25% to match with federal money of 75% in order to have one of these centers built. 
So the Kennedys, through their foundation, the Joseph E. Hinton Kennedy Foundation, named after their son who was killed during World War II. And uh, they gave uh, money, uh, seed money, to centers around the country, including the one in the Bronx uh, at the at the Albert Einstein Medical School. And then there were some other local donors, and then they had to apply, and, and they eventually got 75% of the money to build that research center. Now, there was also another component of the act, and that was the the uh, the, the development of disability centers. It was really uh, to uh, promote uh, clinical advancements in the field and change in the field. Uh, in fact, uh, 20 of those were awarded, not one to, particularly to the one in the Bronx, uh, but around the country, there were 20, including in special education facilities and, and universities and so on. But what happened was when the one in the Bronx was built, Mrs. Shriver said she wanted to make sure that there were people being taken care of, not just researchers, who would be some working at some laboratory, but people who would actually be cared for. And in our case, uh, we had a small clinic that was founded in the neighboring hospital, the Jacoby Hospital. Mm -hmm. And uh, that clinic was called the Children's Evaluation Rehabilitation Center. And what happened was that particular program was moved into the first floor of and some components of our second floor of that uh, research center. And that's how that got started. Later on, uh, the what was originally called University Facility, Facilities for these clinical programs uh, found fund, funded by the federal government. Uh, they then uh, modified that and said that you could operate one of those programs and get funding from the federal government without building a new uh, uh, building. Mm -hmm. So we were then in 1964 designated to be what was then called the University Affiliated Facility which was then become the university affiliated program. And now it's been renamed over the years to be called a university center for education and, and training in, in developmental disabilities. So that's a bit of the history of the Kennedy Center. It started as a research building, but it became a large clinical program as well with outreach into the various components of the community, which I helped develop over the years. Mm -hmm. I came there, as I said, a fellow. I became the assistant director. And then in 1972 to 74, somewhere in that range, I became the co-director and then director of the, of the university affiliated program and the Children's Evaluation Rehabilitation Center. And, and to just put a word about that, Dr. Taft, who founded the program, was a pediatric neurologist who had trained at Boston Children's. Um, interestingly, at Boston Children's had one of the earliest clinics for children with cerebral palsy. Mm. And Dr. Taft was very interested and became trained in that. So that when he came to Albert Einstein after the medical school opened, and again in 1956 he came, he established a cerebral palsy clinic, which became a pediatric rehab clinic, mm -hmm. and then also uh, became a, what was called a developmental evaluation clinic for non-physically disabled children. So and the, the two eventually one, merged to become the Children's Evaluation Rehabilitation Center, which was the program that moved into the Kennedy Center. Mm. So the other one, so the other clinic helped other children that weren't disabled, correct? Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, again, we had two components. One was the Development Evaluation Clinic, which was a clinic for diagnosing two children's problem were were at the time. And, uh, to, and then began expanding to provide a variety of interventions for them, uh, behavioral interventions and medications when necessary and, and uh, physical occupational therapy as well as speech, speech therapy. Uh, but the other component was this pediatric rehabilitation program. The vast majority of children taken care of were children with cerebral palsy. So we did have children with muscular dystrophy and spina bifida and, and some children with, uh, with a variety of other physical problems who also were cared for in that uh, program. Um, did, okay, now, around the same time, uh, in the 1960s, Robert Kennedy uh, called Willowbrook a snake pit. Did you have any, um, did you have any take or, or did you have any uh, thing, um, was, uh, how can I word this? Did you, did you have anything to do with, um, 
um, either helping with pediatrics at Willowbrook during that time, and if you did, uh, how uh, how was pediatrics during the 1960s, uh, you know, in terms of, you know, the treatment of people with disabilities, um, and how, uh, how has it evolved since then? Um, obviously, it's gotten better, but... There have been a lot of changes, and, and there were some early pediatricians like Dr. Taft, and uh, there was a, a one in Connecticut who was connected actually to Yale, and, and a few others, Dr. Cook at, at, at uh, Johns Hopkins, uh, who became interested in, in, in the care of children with special needs. But the pediatricians were not leaders at that time in the field. Unfortunately, it was associated more with mental disability and psychiatry. And Ryan Lodge, a psychiatrist, ran these large institutions for people with mental illness as well as people with, quote, mental retardation and intellectual disabilities. So um, that was the nature of things in, into the 1960s. Uh, I'm aware of families who wound up putting their family member in, into a place like Willowbrook or Letchworth Village, which was another large facility. Um, we had really had no significant connection to, to the, the facilities at the time. But we were well aware that these places were really very poor. They very, take took very poor care of people. Mm -hmm. They were crowded. Uh, there were no services. There were no treatments. Um, and he even went to visit some of these places uh, and saw what was going on. But we didn't have the power to change. Now, I think you're alluding to the fact that not only Robert Kennedy, but also uh, uh, the media got into the whole issue of, of, of visiting these places, and, and Rado Rivera made a big uh, 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 program about that, and uh, showing how poor and awful these places were. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I have to say that, again, they were predominantly run by psychiatrists, but in New York uh, and in some other places, like Nebraska and a few other places around the country, uh, there began to, uh, to be a movement uh, to try to change things and from from getting more pediatricians involved, getting other uh, medical specialists or other professionals involved. And uh, I actually became an advocate uh, for change. And uh, in 1971, I was approached by the the uh, director of the uh, uh, Department of Mental Hygiene, it was called then, but it was an office of, of people with uh, mental retardation, it was called in those days and asked whether I would actually start a state program in the Bronx for people with development disabilities and start taking people out of institutions. So we started a program called Bronx Developmental Services while I was also still running our clinic and center. And uh, what we started to do was we established a network of community-based programs and we um, uh, units in various parts of the Bronx where we were based and we started to help uh, families keep their own family member in the home with other uh, services if we could find them. And sometimes we just try to help develop them on our own. We've established a part, an apartment living program for people who are high functioning, people with uh, developmental problems, including physical disabilities. We work with a bunch of other agencies, um, United Cerebral Palsy, Association for Help of Retarded Children, in uh, helping them found group of homes. We found them one ourselves, the group home, one of the first ones, state op operated ones in the Bronx. And we began to take people out of Willowbrook and actually became a component of what was then a, um, a lawsuit to basically change Willowbrook and to start removing people from there. Uh, I testified in a class action suit about the need for developmental programs and, and to move people out, but also to get substantial services even in places like Willowbrook while the people were living in there, living there. But I think a lot of that was promoted first of all by the, the, the whole issue of the Kennedys making it quote, socially acceptable to have a, a, a family member with a developmental disability and to try to do something about it. And then the media getting involved with, with the exposés on places like Willowbrook and Lexworth Village and Pennhurst in Pennsylvania and, and uh, uh, there was a, a place in Alabama uh, where there was a big lawsuit by it versus Stickney um, to try to bring about change. And the change occurred through advocacy, through legislative change, and for the pressure of the media, and very, very greatly by the pressure from families.
And so, I have to stress the importance of that because of the fact that uh, I was well aware and worked with some very key people who were family members who became leaders in trying to, both nationally and locally, to get uh, people uh, into the community and, and improve the kind of care and services. One little anecdote I'll just tell you to give you an idea of what life was like in those days. I became very friendly with a woman named Elizabeth Boggs. Elizabeth Boggs was actually a member of one of the original members of the panel. She was from New Jersey. Mm -hmm. She and her husband are both college professors. And she told me the story of when she had a young uh, child who developed a, a, some brain damage from probably an infection, encephalopathy of some kind. And uh, she, um, she said people would come to their house and say, how could you have a child like this? You're so brilliant, you and your husband. She had a PhD in theoretical chemistry and her husband was a professor. And that really motivated her to want to make changes. So she became the first woman to be the head of the National Association for Retarded Citizens. She was on various advisory groups that I met her, including the President's Committee on Mental Retardation, which I became vice chairman of, um, actually through through Una Shriver's pressure on President uh, Carter to appoint me. And, and But people like Elizabeth took leadership roles, as did so many other people, mm -hmm in trying to both inside the system and outside the system to provide advice and, and advocacy and, and develop legislative changes uh, and then eventually uh, going to the courts to try to assure that there would be better care and services for people with disabilities. Um, talking about uh, parents and how strong advocacy is, um, Explain more, because you know we we had Mary Bonsignor and other other parents in the de, in the developmental disability movement. Explain more about how strong parents were during that time. But why did it take? Uh, a pa um, why why were why weren't things quote unquote? Let's see if I say this right. Why weren't things quote unquote fixed? right away and then parents had to um, kind of jump in there. Why did it take uh, why did it take the work of parents to kind of fix the system? I love Mary Monsignor. She's one of my favorite consumers. Yeah. I'll tell you the story of Mary, which is illustrative. Now here you had, you know, you had people like like uh, you had a Shriver and you had people like other the broad, educated people, people with good strong connections and politically and otherwise. Um, but there were so many parents that didn't know what to do and how to go about affecting change. And some of them built organizations. A uh, little anecdote to the Association for Help of, children, of Retarded Children, as it was called in, in New York City. Mm -hmm. uh, one uh, parent put an ad in a local newspaper saying, I have a, a young adult son at home and I've got no help or services for him. Are there are parents like me? And 300 applied to that ad. And that they had a meeting, and that, that the founding of the uh, of the AHRC, or the Shape of our Children in New York City. Now it's interesting you brought up Mary as an example, but when we established the Bronx Developmental Services Program, we had a team of professionals in various regions throughout the Bronx, and in the West Bronx we had a very activist team leader who was a social worker. And we had another person who you already met, Joanne Siegel, who uh, I know you've already interviewed, who was a, a very smart and very effective uh, community uh, uh, outreach person. And they established a training program for parents to teach them how to advocate, to show them where they should go, how they should do it, where the legislators are, and so on. And people like Mary, myself, and, and Joanne even showed up. Uh, Mayor Giuliani wanted to cut actually funding, limited funding for services in New York City that they were providing for people with intellectual disabilities. And we all showed up and we had a rally outside of City Hall. And we had, we had everybody from a rabbi to a minister to, uh, uh, to parents to myself speaking at that. And eventually the pressure on Ray, Mayor Giuliani was that he would not reduce the funding for those services. He promised it at a, to a parent. So uh, it shows you that 
you need to kind of help people to kind of point them in the right direction in order so that they learn how, what, how the system works and what they can do to try to change it. It's not easy to change. No. I mean, we've all learned that over the years. You, I'm sure, know that very well, that change doesn't happen very rapidly. Like it, do, it, doesn't, it doesn't happen overnight. It does not, and it takes a lot of continuing work, effort, and trying to buttonhole people who can affect change, who are in the leadership roles, you know, legislatively or programmatically or in state and the local government or whomever. Mm -hmm. um, now, we have some time left. The future of developmental disabilities. I know that there's been, you know, different states work differently, but in terms of, um, you know, change, how do you see this state of development, the services for developmental disabilities? Uh, well, we talked about the past, we talked about a little bit about the present, but how do you see it in the future? Well, you know, every state is different and that's a problem. Um, I, um, one of the, I, we, have a, we have a training program for developmental pediatricians in, uh, uh, at, 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 at the Kennedy Center. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a very successful program. And one of, our, one of our former trainees recently became the commissioner for the Office of People with Developmental Disabilities in Albany, in, in New York State. And he found there were tremendous obstacles to trying to affect change in the job that he, that he had. Uh, among those were people who control the budgets. Mm. And also, you have people who don't want the institutions closed mm. and people who don't want the kind of services that you want developed in the community because there was uh, opposition to development of community residences. That's less now than it used to be. When I first started, it was very, very it's called It's called NIMBY, not in my backyard. A lot of people don't want people that, with disabilities that's living. That's exactly right. Yeah. Uh, I went to community meetings and got roasted by mm. people in the community, got threatened by people in the community. Uh, but there are a lot of, uh, there are a lot of uh, interests involved. For example, some of the large agencies want to control what happens in the vision and giving out money, while smaller agencies don't do don't have the same amount of clout. To even though they may be local, they may represent the minority groups rather than some of the others. Uh, and there's and there's also unions who may you know have a vested interest in keeping some of the institutions going. Um, and it varies from state to state. I think one of the driving forces in emptying the institutions, by the way, is now fiscal. It costs so much to keep an institution running. The last figure I saw that uh, around the country, the average was over $200,000 per year <clears throat> per resident to stay in a, in a facility. Is so it, is legislators it? and governors are looking at that and saying, well, maybe I can, maybe it's less cost less so I can get out in the community. But putting a community doesn't guarantee you're going to get all the services you need. Is either. it? Is it more? Uh, I'm I'm sorry for interrupting. Is it more to keep someone in an institution versus a group home? That's an interesting question because uh, group home operations are cheap, but they are cheaper in the vast majority of cases than the institutions. Um, but to provide the range of services you need, you really have to spend money to do that. And that includes all the therapies and behavioral interventions you may need and so on. Uh, so, uh, but it's interesting because the, the under Medicaid, you have a, a, um, a program where basically uh, you can, you have the option now of, of moving somebody into in the community uh, and, and but you have to demonstrate that that costs less than it would in the institution. But most of the times you can do that. Mm -hmm. So I think that, that you know, the alternatives to institutional care are certainly there. And But do they vary from state to state? Yes, absolutely they do. Mm -hmm. And as we, we know, there are some states that are fiscally much, much tighter and, and don't have uh, more generous use of Medicaid, which is, by the way, one of the major ways of funding a lot of the community services as well as was originally uh, the institutional care. Mm -hmm. uh, but not every state has expanded Medicaid. Um, 
And we know that that's become a little political uh, hot potato that some of the more conservative states, they have it. But you know, being a conservative state doesn't always mean that you can't be progressive. For example, in, in Nebraska, they've always had a very, uh, very um, um, aggressive community program development that was led by a couple of, of leader, leader, leaders, uh, actually physicians, uh, in one case, a psychiatrist. Um, and in upstate New York, another psychiatrist led the development of community programs. Uh, but uh, interesting too, uh, another little anecdote, uh, uh, there's a waiver program I just mentioned where you can move people into the community or out of a hospital into, into care. And it started actually in Iowa. Mm. Uh, there was a woman named Mrs. Beckett and she had a, a, a daughter, Katie Beckett, who was in the hospital and who could not be moved. She was on a respirator and could not be moved in the community because there was no way of paying for it. And uh, she went to a local legislator, a Republican uh, senator, who called President Reagan at the time, Reagan at the time, this is in the 1980s, and said, uh, you know, I can't take my, do you know, told him about the story. And he said, let's change it. And that led to the development of the waiver program, which was a means of taking a, a, a girl like Katie out of the hospital and bringing him home with her, her home with nursing care or whatever, uh, under this waiver program. So if you find the right button to press, <laughs> the right legislator to advocate for you, you can achieve change, but it's not always easy. But let me just re, you know, re emphasize that. Do you, do I met a lot of legislators in the Bronx, and some were effective and some were not. And I won't go any further to describe some of the problems. Do you find, uh, for example, take the state of Vermont, the state that I'm in, do you find that as the smaller the state, the better services the person can get? in terms of developmental disability services? I don't think there's a rule about that. There are certainly some small states that have done well and some big states. For example, California has had a very wide range of, of, of community services developed over the years by, uh, by a governor and, and a, a senator called Lanterman, uh, who state senator, who had developed this, this, community, this um, regional service group. And New York also has done well because they very, very, very aggressively use Medicaid to fund their services and be able to expand them. I and mean, most of New York State's budget is a Medicaid budget. Mm. Uh, so so it, large states can do well, small states can do well. I think uh, the one of the morals of the story example with the Katie Beckett story was that you can be in a relatively small state where you can access your local legislator maybe more easily than you can in a larger state or a regional uh, legislator or a state senator or whatever and you may be able to press the right buttons in order to affect change mm -hmm. so i don't think there's a cardinal rule that says a small state or a big state may do better because some are better than us i think a lot depends on on who the legislators and who the governors are and uh, what their point of view is. And I'll tell you some other anecdotes. I remember I was president of the Association of the University Affiliated Facilities or Centers, whatever they're called now. And uh, we were worried during the Reagan administration they were gonna cut out services. And uh, we met with Assistant Secretary who was originally from California, who was very conservative, I won't mention her name. But she said, I'm gonna eliminate your kind of programs so we said, but you know, our programs are national and there are every, practically every state now. And uh, said, well, we don't care. So uh, we were able to um, press the right button. So one of the key people, there was a director of a center in Utah, by the name of Marvin Fifield, who happened to be friends with Senator Hatch. Mm -hmm. And he was on an advisory group for Senator Hatch, who was a very conservative Republican legislator. And uh, Marv called Senator Hatch and Senator Hatch said, oh, you know, I know your program is a valuable program and uh, I'll pick up the phone and call the president. And he did. Mm. And right away, no problem continuing funding. Um, so, I mean, it, it, you know, there's a tremendous amount of, of, of local kinds of things. I went into a legislator's office and, and starting in with a legislator from Illinois, uh, who was head of a important committee in, in Congress. 
And I, he said, what are you here for? And I said, well, we're here because we provide services and our centers provide a lot of services for people with disabilities. He said, you don't have to go any further. He said, I had a brother-in-law who was uh, intellectually limited and uh, I know all about the issues and problems. So sometimes if you deal with a, a knowledgeable person who is a legislator, who is a family member, that also helps mm -hmm. get where you want mm -hmm. to go. Well, um, again, we would like to thank you so much for joining us on this edition of Babled and On Air. Uh, happy holidays and, and thank you so much. Uh, where can people turn if they would like to find out more information on the Kennedy Center? Is there, uh, can you give the website? Well, we have a website. The Kennedy Center has a website. Our Children's Evaluation and Rehabilitation Center has a website. They can find it there. Uh, you can look it up. We're in the Bronx. We're affiliated with Albert Einstein Medical School. And we also with Montefiore Medical Center now, which is the uh, parent agency for the clinic. Uh, so they can look it up and see the kinds of things that we do. And there are other places around the country that do similarly. Uh, we're proud of what we developed over the years. At one time, we were say, we're having about 8,000 people a year and about 50,000 plus visits. So, but there are other large centers, uh, and I'm sure that, and there's one in every state now. So, uh, so there's a program you can look up in your own state, uh, usually federally funded for serving people with disabilities. Anyway, good luck to you, Lawrence. It was nice speaking with you today. Okay. Okay, thank you for joining us on this edition of Ableton on Air. Uh, for more information on um, the Albert Einstein College of Medicine and the Kennedy Center, you can go to www.einsteinmed.edu. That's www.einsteinmed.edu. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Dr. Thank you Her Herb Gold. Thank you for the good work you're doing. Okay. Thank you and happy holidays. Uh, for more from okay. Uh, for more information on um, on uh, Albert Einstein and the College of Medicine and the Kennedy Center, so that's www.einsteinmed.edu. Um, we would like to thank our uh, sponsors, Washington County Mental Health, Green Mountain Support Services, and um, the partnerships. Um, for this program, the partnership uh, with the Rose F. Kennedy Center and the Albert Einstein College of Medicine and many other partnerships uh, in Vermont, inc also including the Association for the Blind and Visually Impaired, the Division for the Blind and Visually Impaired, and many, many, many others. Uh, thank you again, Dr. Cohen, and uh, this puts an end to this edition of Ableton on Air. I'm Lauren Seiler. See you next time. Abled in On Air is sponsored by Green Mountain Support Services, empowering people with disabilities to be home in the community. Washington County Mental Health, where hope and support comes together. Media sponsors for Abled in On Air include Parkchester Times, Muslim Community Report, www.thisisthebronx.info, Associated Press Media Editors, New York Parrot Online Newspaper, U.S. Press Corps, Domestic and International, Anchor FM, and Spotify. Partners for Ableton On Air include Yachad New York and New England, where everyone belongs, The Orthodox Union, the Vermont Division for the Blind and Visually Impaired, the Vermont Association for the Blind and Visually Impaired, the Montpelier Sustainable Coalition, Central Vermont Habitat for Humanity. Able Den on Air has been seen in the following publications, Parkchester Times, New York Parrot Online Newspaper, Muslim Community Report, www.thisisthebronx.info, 
and www.ace.com. Ableton On Air is a member of the National Academy for Television Arts and Sciences, Boston, New England chapter.